I just want to say welcome to MGS Con. I really hope you guys have an incredible time. I'm grateful that we're here doing something for fun and for a great cause. So enjoy the day. Come say hi to all the actors. We love you as much as you love these characters. So we are deeply grateful that you have, some of you have gone to great lengths to come here today. Uh, we hope to repeat this event. I would love to take it all over, you know, to New York, to San Diego, Dallas, uh, even to the UK. I hear Portugal has an incredible Metal Gear community. Let's go, right? So rack up those frequent flyer miles so we can all meet up once more and again and again. Let's do this again and again. Have a great day, and we love you. Yes, Metal Gear! All right, give it up for Vanessa Marshall. Hey. <laughs> and now our very first panel of the day, the content creators panel. Come on up, Robert. Hey, everyone. My name is Robert Peeler. I used to be a community manager for Metal Gear, the franchise during the Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain. Uh, it was a fantastic time. I really loved it. And I got to meet a few people, including this guy right here, uh, and I'm going to introduce all of them to you so that you can talk to them about their amazing work creating content for you on YouTube, on stream, just throughout all the social networks you could possibly find, and let's go ahead and get started. My first guest here is DRK. You might know him as a streamer who does marathon runs of the entire Metal Gear series. Come on over. So then let me introduce another one. Uh, this guy is a fantastic creator. I was able to thankfully get him a chance to play MGS5 before it came out, and he had some awesome opinions. He created some really great videos. And now I hear he's a voice actor of all kinds, so come on up, Young A, let's get it here. <laughs> Second content creator here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and then our third one, I have, this is the first time I'm meeting this guy. Uh, I watched his videos, they're really awesome. Uh, I love like the kind of video format where someone is looking through all the different titles and breaking down the themes and coming up with different ideas and theories as to what and why and when, what the developers were thinking, and what the hell was Kojima thinking. So let's bring up Max Derrett, who does one of those awesome creators. <laughs> talk about all his video content, and I don't know, maybe we'll get projectors? So let's go ahead and start with... Um, a little bit of history, I want to get uh, some idea, everybody's history with this series. Right. Obviously, you play it a lot on stream. You've been creating videos for a long time. You've been yeah. doing a lot of introspective videos. Uh, can you tell us about uh, the first time you found Metal Gear and your impressions of it on that first impression? Mm -hmm. Let's start on the left here. Uh, so actually, this is going to sound funny. Uh, my first contact with Metal Gear was through an um, official PlayStation Magazine demo disc. Uh, that m I used to only have demo discs for a long time uh, with my PS1, so... Um, and I actually, the funny story is I actually avoided it for a long time mm. because I kept hearing that it was too cinematic. And too my little eight-year-old brain thought I would be boring. <laughs> so I played literally every other demo on that disc until there was nothing left, and like, okay, let's try this out. And then I got hooked. Nice. That's what they aim for when they make so, cinematics, to get boring content on the, in the game, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Yong, what, do you, what was your first time playing uh, Metal Gear? Yeah, so Metal Gear Solid 1 was my first game, and I remember very distinctly, um, I, I, so I, I lived in Venezuela before I came to the U.S., and there was a friend of mine uh, in our apartment complex, a neighbor, whose, ha whose apartment I visited, and I remember seeing this, like, disc case. This was the PC copy of, of Metal Gear Solid. And I remember uh, Yoji Shinkawa's artwork on the cover immediately, like, drawing my attention. I'm like, what is that? I've never seen... <laughs> like art that looks like that, a character represented in that way. And uh, he was like, oh, I'm already done with the game here. You, you can borrow it, play for yourself. And then I booted it up. And the second I see Snake diving through the water before uh, you know he lands on Shadow Moses and the music kicks in, I was just like, okay, I'm in, yeah. And then I hear David Hayter's voice, you know, Colonel, can you hear me? I'm just like, all right, okay, all right, you got me, you got me. And from then on, you know, the rest is history. Immediately after one, I wanted to play through two. That screwed me up when I was a kid. Yeah. That ending, oh my god, I didn't know what was going on. But I knew this was a really special, unique series from then on. And uh, I've played all of them since. So yeah. Awesome. Max? So uh, if I, I, 
if I recall correctly, I think my f earliest childhood memory was watching my dad play Metal Gear Solid 1 at the age of five or six, which, you know, if any of you have watched my channel, probably, you know, explains so much about why I'm so messed up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it, but I just remember watching some of the stuff that he was doing, like Psycho Mantis, you know, breaking the fourth wall and, uh, you know, just the eccentricities of all the different villains and just thinking to myself, wow, this is the coolest thing that I've ever seen and probably will ever see. And ever since then, it just hooked me on uh, that Kojima flavor and style. And I've, every single time a new game has come out, I always got to pick it up and enjoy it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, like for the last several years, we've been through a drought, but looks like that's finally ending with the release of uh, Delta, which we're all very much looking forward to. Woo! Hopefully yeah. it turns out good. And, uh, yeah, it's shaped my life in positive ways ever since. Nice. Now, the unique aspect of this panel is that all these people are, are content creators, people who create content based on this wonderful series that we all enjoy. So what was, like, your first start? When did you first start streaming the game or, like, really putting out uh, your name associated with Metal Gear and the stuff that uh, you do now? Okay, so my streaming career goes all the way back to 2009. Some, sometime half, in the second half of 2009, I started streaming on what was then called Justin TV. Yeah. And I had absolutely no expectations of it. It was just, just a hobby, just something I thought it would be cool to do. And uh, again, not being exactly aware of what was going on at the time, I thought I was kind of good at the game, I guess, and I wanted to show off, and I quickly got humbled by, well, <laughs> over the years, you know, discovering that the online community, all the other content creators, the speedrunners, I didn't even know speedrunning was a thing back then. Um, yeah, so that kind of humbled me a little bit. Um, but I distinctively remember having, um, I, I think I'm Just One was the first, um, one of the first games that I streamed. Mm. And back then on Justin TV in 2009, if you had, I don't know, 100 viewers, you know, you were one of the top dogs. Uh, I remember this particular moment, I was like in Rex's hangar and my viewers got up to like 70 and I was excited. Um, I had absolutely no expectation and it's turned into a, a a profit, I guess, uh, a career for me, something nice. I can make a living off of, which I can't believe I'm sending, well, no, not sending, I'm sitting, but I am in front of all of you guys uh, talking about how I play Metal Gear for a living here uh, 14 years after I first discovered Justin TV. So that's so cool. It, Metal Gear is quite literally my life now. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, you put thousands life. and thousands of hours. It, it's, well, it's a dedication. Yeah, you put sorry, I don't want to take up too much time. But that's yeah, okay. even before I started streaming, I was already uh, obviously playing Metal Gear um, since I'm just once released. And before that, with mm -hmm. the demo disc. Nice. Nice, man. Young. Well, I'm, if people have watched my content, uh, you'll know that Metal Gear Solid V was really what I covered. Uh, I remember gra seeing Ground Zeroes for the first time and think, like, I couldn't believe the graphics, especially. Um, and also Kojima showing off the game live and, like, non-scripted and uh, just seeing how uh, reactive the, the Ground Zeroes map was and all the soldiers and, and the way everything was laid out. Um, and since then, and I'm like, why is nobody else, like, or not nobody else, but like, it, the Metal Gear content creation scene just wasn't as big. And I just feel like I, there's this void that I needed to fill. Um, like, uh, it's this game that I love, and I feel like nobody was covering it as hardcore as, like, I was intending to. So I was like, screw it, let's do it. Uh, I, w I just want to cover this game for a while. And, uh, you know, over the years, you know, my, that's where my audience base really grew. That's when, like, I really feel like I was starting to make it as a YouTuber, um, and I just had so much fun uh, trying to figure out Kojima's brain uh, as he uh, marketed. You know, Phantom Pain. I remember you know seeing seeing Metal Gear Solid Five being fitting perfectly yeah. in the grooves. You guys remember that? Oh my God! And from then on, I'm like, oh, the games have begun. The game is like. With Kojima, the game starts before it launches, you know what I mean? You're, you're playing the marketing game as well and trying to figure things out. And so it was like this really fun game that the community could play together. And that's what really drew me to Metal Gear Solid V coverage. And uh, all the way to the end, you know, all kinds of crazy theories. And uh, it, was, it was just a blast. Those, I think of those times very fondly. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can get something like that. At some point in the future, but. that Metal Gear ARG system that we <laughs> right, right, exactly. pump that into you know Delta and anything else. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Max, uh, tell us about your origins with the uh, Metal Gear content. So, I started doing YouTube uh, consistently, I think around 2015, and then in 20, 
like I just did videos basically on whatever I wanted for sub several subsequent years, and then I didn't. When did I do? So the, the video that I'm, I suppose I'm most well known for is called The Most Profound Moment in Gaming History. And <laughs> the funny thing is, I didn't actually come up with the title for that. I, I borrowed it from uh, a friend of mine who actually happens to be here in the audience, I, I imagine. There he is, yeah. Just stand up if you want, man. Like that, <laughs> this is Logo Steve. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, he gave me his blessing to do uh, a video with the same title because his video is my all-time favorite YouTube video and uh, I wanted to sort of provide my own flavor talking about that moment. And he said, yeah, go ahead, man. And then, what, like three or four years later, it's like three million views and uh, it changed my life for the better. It allowed me to be able to do, uh, like talk about stuff like Metal Gear and a whole bunch of other really in-depth games and deep games with deep themes like Metal Gear. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, the story. Hopefully that was coherent, sorry. No, that's awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm curious before we dive deep into any individual content, uh, obviously a lot of you are like experts now at, at this point having created so much content for Metal Gear and really kind of dive deep into a lot of the aspects of it. But I'm curious what your blind spots are. This is a big series. Is there anything that you're just like, I have no idea. Where no, you, where we're perfect. We know it inside and out. We're, how dare you? We'll start with you, Max, since you volunteered. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Your perfect record? No, no, we, we all will have blind spots. I was just joking. No, but what, what would be your major blind, point, uh, blind spot, you think? Well, acid, probably. Just one and two. Because, mm. uh, like, the stuff that's outside of Kojima's main line, um, yeah. I'd say, yeah. I am historically bad at remembering like years and dates. Like history was my worst subject in school because of that. Because I like during tests, I'm like ah, 1950 cramp. So like uh, I always know like you know Operation Snake Eater you know took place in the 1960s and stuff like that. But then like as the timeline goes further on, I'm like wait, was it 2005, 2004? So like dates, I I want to remember the dates so I can like map things out in my brain when I'm trying to remember Metal Gear lore. But that, then I get my dates confused a lot, so that that tends to be a blind spot for me when I'm like trying and to that, cover content. And the series is constantly pushing a date in front of you too. It's right, like, right. Don't exactly. forget that this happened, and then after that. Yeah, this exactly. Happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like okay, dear okay? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to go with Max here mostly. Uh, the game that I'm probably least familiar with is Acid Two. I did play Acid One. Um, one thing. Uh, I'm sorry if this might be a later question, but. In the main series, if we're not talking spin-offs, I kind of wish I was a little more familiar with the 2D games, the MSX okay. games. Um, I haven't quite mastered those yet, uh, like the others, so I, I think that kind of counts as a blind spot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, they always get packaged in with like new releases and stuff, but I do think people kind of overlook them, uh, and considering how influential yeah, they were in right. the beginnings. It's don't do that, especially Metal Gear 2. Metal Gear 2 is a game that is on par with MGS1. Oh, man. It's, just, yeah. it's 2D MGS. Exactly. Yes. So, like, it's, that's straight up what it is, and it, you can see like where yeah. Metal Gear Solid came but from. They, but yeah. they are harder. They are, especially the you know the first game is a little rough, Yeah. but it is the first game that we're getting sure. there. You know, so. But Metal Gear 2 definitely would, would deserve that kind of attention, I think. Yeah. yeah I, agree with that. I, I haven't played Acid either, actually, so I, I'm right there with you. Should I? Would you guys recommend it? Uh, yeah. Should I dive yeah. into it? I was, <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's good for a portable game. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. It's all right. a fun departure gameplay wise. I think the story holds up pretty well. Okay. Okay. I, would, I, would recommend I hear two like improves mm. upon one a lot. Yeah. So all right. Appreciate it. Uh, so yeah. There, I wouldn't. I won't subject you all to to give your rankings of your favorite Metal Gear games. Oh, but but I do. <laughs> but I do want you to kind of voice what your favorite uh, game to make content about is. If there's like any particular one in the franchise, and you're like, oh, making content for that's the mm -hmm. best one. Mm -hmm. Be good or bad. Either way, it could be anything that you want to highlight or uh, destroy. Yeah, I can't, I can't say that that would be the same answer for both of those. My favorite game is two, but whenever I mention I'm just two, you gotta mention I'm just one, because to me, they're the same side, that they're, they're two sides of the same coin, because mm -hmm. yeah. they work together. Yeah. Um, but as weird as it is, um, my, I, I guess I have a lot of fun making content for the Phantom Pain, for mm. reasons that were probably not entirely anticipated when developing the game, or creating <laughs> the game. Um, so I'm gonna go with, I'll just give you, uh, unless you want me to elaborate. No, yeah, uh, I, I, do, I do have a lot of fun 
creating content, I guess, technically for the Phantom Pain. Unfortunately, I forgot it on my desk, but I would have shown you the, the little necklace again. Yeah, yeah. So he was showing me this uh, uh, Death Stranding inspired. Yeah, kind of like Death Stranding inspired. The key data necklace kind of thing. Right. Uh, and it made up of MGS5 saves, since you can't have more yeah, than one MGS5 Yeah, since we have no saves. save slots. <laughs> <laughs> one critique, one critique. Uh, Max, uh, what's your favorite? I'm guessing it's MGS2, considering that cheer you gave when you mentioned it. <laughs> right, yeah. No, can, like, I don't know, do I, the camera there? Yeah, it's, it's, I like MGS2, you know, the opening of Metal Gear Solid 3, where I ask you what game you like. Yeah. It's got that right here. Yeah, Metal Gear Solid 2. Um, the, the video that I mentioned before, the most profound moment in gaming history, the moment in question is the final codec conversation between Raiden and the Patriot AI at the very end of that. And uh, yeah, not just that moment, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff within that game that I could talk for hours about uh, because I just, I, intellectually speaking, I suppose you can make the argument that Metal Gear Solid 2 is the most dense and that's sort of the stuff that I try to aim for with my content. Mm. But that's not to say that that's devoid in any of the other games because there's a lot of wonderful philosophical, psychological stuff that you can talk about in all those. But yeah, two, definitely two. Nice. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's got to be five. You know, uh, that's what the majority of my Metal Gear coverage has been. Uh, I guess namely because, you know, I, I started YouTubing after all the other games that come out, but also just the... The insanity of Metal Gear Solid V theorizing was just so much fun. Uh, and, and Kojima really took all of his ARG-style marketing to a whole new level with PT, with Silent Hills, and with Metal Gear Solid V. So for me, it was like the best era for the community to come together and try to like figure things out. And so I feel like the Metal Gear community really kind of uh, grew during that time and, and really just ha had a lot of fun um, leading up to the launch of Metal Gear Solid V in a way that uh, I think was just unprecedented uh, for any video game, really. And so I, I, I think of those moments fondly, and so I, 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 I yeah, <coughs> love I to agree. cover that game. <laughs> 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 so uh, you always face, like, unique kind of challenges given the kind of content that you create. It's obviously there's a lot of bleed over, there's a lot of crossover in terms of the kind of stuff you guys create. It's the same series as well. But there's different audiences, there's different... Uh, Competing, mm. you know, streamers, competing content creators. Um, you, know, you often put out stuff that's like news-based, what's yeah. hot out there in the gaming right. industry, and let's talk about that. What do you uh, feel like is a struggle that you've experienced trying to compete with maybe other voices that have similar uh, themes or concepts? Uh, uh, sorry, Man, um, I try not to think of it as like competing with somebody else, and I just focus more on what makes me unique and just try to like lean into that, you know? it's. Uh, your own personality, it's, you know, every single one of you are unique individuals. And if you lean into that and make that shine, people want to hang out with you because they relate to someone who just is, maybe does the same type of content, but does it in a way that appeals to them. Yeah. And so it's just important to, to like, embrace who you are as a person and uh, be proud of who you are and just put that out there. And the people who gravitate towards you will gravitate towards you. Um, you know, I make a a, a, a certain style of content and you know not everyone digs it per se but a lot of people do as well and so it's about finding your, your audience based on who you are and just embracing yourself and so for me it's I don't think of it as a struggle like oh my god how do I compete with these people I think of it as just how do I be the best version of myself and people will just kind of naturally be drawn to you if you're authentic, I think. Yeah. Nice. Max, yeah. I like you agree. I echo your sentiments, man. Like, I never, like, I watch your videos all the time, and I never felt the need to compete with you. Right. It's just a matter of, like, what is, what's the particular thing that you want to bring towards the fan community that you feel could be original or yeah. worthwhile, and combine it with everybody else's love and just, you know, yeah. make a big basket of love. Yeah, that's like, what I'm trying to say. If you love the content you make, then, I mean, you'll pour everything into it, and the audience will feel the love that you put into that content. They'll feel the passion because the content will speak for itself. And so, um, yeah, just there just you go. Love do you, you feel do like that camaraderie uh, among the larger streaming community for Metal Gear content creation? Uh, oh, absolutely. Like Apache absolutely. Smash and everything like that. You think all, you guys work together on this? So, season. my channel is for a large part, is the sum of three people's efforts coming together. I would not be here today. The channel wouldn't be as big as it is today if uh, we didn't all come together. Uh, so I would like to, to thank Unitemare and 3Dog, even though they couldn't be here today, uh, for making it what it is. So for one thing, it is absolutely not about competition. It is 
about um, you know two communities that intermingle and go back and forth between whether it's uh, you know channels, YouTube channels, Twitch ch chats, or whatever. Uh, Everybody benefits from that. Yeah. Every, everybody, um, it, it just it's more than some of its parts when two communities come together. So uh, I absolutely uh, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for other content creators as well. Yeah. And at the same time, um, I would like to uh, also uh, thank um, Bad Humans for his amazing content on Twitter. I'm not, I'm not sure if he's here today right now. I mean, I think it's around here somewhere. Um, but that's a small example of, um, I, I get many people in my chat uh, coming and saying all sorts of things, and sometimes it's something interesting, sometimes it's actual you know, uh, new content, and uh, I don't take all the credit for all my Metal Gear knowledge because of that. Uh, over the years, I've managed to I have all sorts of encounters with, with people coming into my chat, pointing things out, or just, just discovering things, or pointing me to uh, an article I didn't know about. So It's probably all, even more true for you, because it's streaming, you're constantly interacting with your audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you never know who's coming into your chat when you're, when you're streaming. So uh, I don't take credit purely uh, for my, all my knowledge and all my content creation. Uh, it is a sum of all, all, all those factors. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, this feels like a very insular community in that regard, and obviously this first convention being a fan-run convention with fans here and great yeah. attendance is a, a good testament to that. Um, I, you know, I started my career uh, much earlier than when I got into Metal Gear, mm -hmm. and I found like a big contrast when I had shifted from something like Final Fantasy or the Aquabats or something like that to Metal Gear that... Man, do you guys love your conspiracy theories? There's this, <laughs> there's this, this really like heavy, sure deep do. focus on like, but maybe they meant this, and then oh, but he, you, it's quiet. This Chico? interview said that he did in uh, Thailand, and yeah, he's on and on and on. Um, but I'd be curious, do you guys have any? I mean, there's obviously it's fun to kind of just delve into it and be like, well, that's silly, but it's fun. But is are there any like really weird conspiracy theories that you're like, actually, I think that one's true. I think that one is might be a real thing. Let's start with you, DRK. So are we talking something development related or right, lore? Whatever you want. Lore, lore development, related. anything you think is, a, is not well known or even necessarily believed, but you believe it. Mm. Oh, something I actually believe? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> theories that I believe. Well, there's this moment in MGS4 when Johnny performed CPR on Meryl, and immediately after that, as you might know, with the Patriot system being taken over and people's emotions being all scrambled, right? So when Meryl wakes up, she's no longer under the, the nanomachine's control mm. for her emotions. And the first thing she sees is Johnny. So she probably falls in love with him by waking up with all of her nanomachine's controlled emotions being scrambled and imprinting on him. <laughs> that is something that actually... Just like raptors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, I could see that. That's awesome. I like that. <laughs> Young, you have any conspiracy theories that just really resonate true for you? You know, I'm still trying to figure out who voices Eva, man. Right, who? Right. <laughs> who are you? Are you out here? You're out here somewhere, aren't you? Um, and I don't know, there's rumors that it might be uh, the actress who played uh, Ariel in The Little Mermaid or something. And Jody, I, it's like Jody I've Benson. done vocal comparisons, and I'm like, I can kind of see why people are theorizing it might be her. It does kind of sound similar when you hear her talk. Mm. Um, and so I'm like, I'm leaning into that being a possibility, but I don't know for sure. And I hope one day we can figure it out, because I... We, we, we all want to say thank you for bringing this amazing character to life. And it's like, she's just out there um, in the shadows, sneaking around, very true to... To Metal Gear, I guess. <laughs> Give her credit. I mean, we all know people like credit. In right, this, right. In this series. So. <laughs> well, what does she go by? Su Suzetta Mignette or something? Is what yeah. She goes by? Yeah. That's yeah. It. yeah. So. Suzetta Minette. Minette, yeah, some, yeah. Some of her voice acting and laughs are more, uh, some of the most believable and genuinely. Yeah. Like. I love her performance. Like, you forget she's an actress. Yeah, like, exactly. That's Eva. Yeah, yeah. That's it. No, she's awesome. So I just, I hope we get to meet her someday. Max, a conspiracy that you believe is 100% well, true. I can't say. I, there's any conspiracy that I full on believe. There's one that I, regarding the development of Metal Gear Solid 2, that I've always been curious about because it seems to me like what Kojima was trying to go for in that story is 
try to suggest that the ride in section of the game, or at least parts of the game, are taking place in some sort of VR simulation. Like, you know when he's fighting the rays, that, and he's on that gigantic hexagon that's, like, from the VR missions? Where in, where in Arsenal gear is that? Yeah. You know, I don't... Th so that's a question that nobody's ever really been able to... Uh, adequately address. I don't know, maybe somebody can come up to me later and explain it to me. Uh, but, like, obviously we know it's not a VR simulation because of, you know, Metal Gear Solid 4 exists. But just what it, like, what the plan was and how that changed in development until it got released. That's something I've been curious about. Nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, I have, uh, I think, two main other questions for you. One is, uh, I'm curious, just generally speaking, and let's not go into Chapter 3 territory here, but is there anything in the whole series that you're like, this is a kind of a pocket of lore or storytelling or even gameplay that I always wish the Metal Gear series would, you know, in the future or have in the past, but somehow explored in depth, maybe in its own game, a spin-off, or a new edition of the series, and you're like, they really should oh, spend yeah. some time talking about this. What do you got, Young? The boss. Yes. You need to explore the boss, man. Kojima did say during an interview during the Metal Gear Solid V news cycle that he was thinking of making uh, the boss game uh, in World War II, and it, we would like get to essentially see her origin story, but he was like, but... The team was still too young and too inexperienced for that, so we decided to do Metal Gear Solid V, which is like a, a sequel to the Big Boss Saga. And so I was hoping we could get there after V, but then things happened the way they did. And so we're never going to get that, and that's one of the biggest tragedies. Uh, that's, that's one. The boss is my favorite character in the entire series. Uh, her purity and her loyalty, and the fact that she had such an influence that the will that she left behind and the way it was mis misinterpreted by... To, by Zero and Snake, that, like, that's what kick-started the whole saga, the whole conflict, you know? And so like, what a powerful figure somebody has to be to have that level of like, pull on, on two powerful uh, people who uh, would go on very different paths and would you know, cause all this conflict. And so I wish we could have explored that a lot more. Yeah. I've heard that before, and it sounds pretty exciting. I would love yeah. to see that, too. DRK, what, what concept has never been tackled by Metal Gear and needs to be? Um, easy. There was absolutely no reason to move Rising in the timeline when the, the development shift over to Platinum Games. Mm. It turned into something that is completely unrelated to what the original idea behind it was. And uh, still to this day, we will never get a proper Metal Gear Solid Rising between them just 2 and 4 because of that. I understand the gameplay challenges that we're facing. What I do not understand is the reasoning for moving it in the timeline. So that pocket is what yes. you're missing. You're like, oh, yes. please go back to it. And please delve into if, it. If we go back and look at MGS 4s calls, for example, um, there's a little call with Rose where she mentions that um, Roy Campbell was worried about Raiden because he was his commanding officer. Mm, yeah. At no point was the real Campbell Raiden's commanding officer. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that that's what it would have gone with if we uh, go by um, Sonny's last line in MGS 4, you know, it's rising again. Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty sure the concept was already underway, and maybe they would have addressed that, and that's why she says that. And uh, I absolutely do not understand why Rose would say that otherwise. Oh, I mean, it's, it's both an intriguing conspiracy theory and a new concept. I, I, guess, I guess I went there. I didn't mean to. No, no, I like yeah. it. <laughs> Uh, Max, uh, wh where, would we, where would we go? Is it, we going to look at Snake's uh, philanthropy days? Are we right. missing some content there? Is well, there something else? Well, these two actually took both of my answers. <laughs> so, um, the philanthropy, yeah, sure. I mean, like, I wouldn't be opposed to, like, Snake going all over the world and doing missions for philanthropy. He'd have sort of a compressed time to do that because, what, NGS-1 takes place in 2005. The tanker mission takes place in 2007. So that section in between... I'd be fine with that. Anything Metal Gear, I guess, I would be happy with. But uh, other than that, maybe Revengeance 2? Yes. Yeah, I'd yeah. be down for that. Because that's the, the greatest... You can make an argument that that's one of the top ten greatest games that never got a sequel in the history of the medium, <laughs> I would say. Uh, drk has got... I, he's I, itching to tell us I more. did want to mention another point in the timeline that is mm. kind of convoluted because... Uh, now we're talking Portal Blobs territory. So mm. I'm not talking about whether it's canon or not. What I'm talking about is that uh, clearly for Peace Walker, they came up with a whole different unit 
for Big Boss, you know, MSF, I love MSF, but don't get me wrong. Those years, supposedly, bef between uh, Portal Blobs and Peace Walker, if we just go by the timeline, forget that it's not a Kojima game, I get that. But this is a problem that kind of spills into Peace Walker as well, as much as I love Peace Walker. Peace Walker is my number three favorite after I'm just doing one. Um, the year that Big Boss was supposedly in the Patriots, mm -hmm. created Fox Sound, had the falling out with Zero, finds out about the clones, and then goes to MSF, and then goes back to lead Fox Sound again. That is a whole, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of <laughs> yeah, unknown, okay. unknown territory, right? Uh, because it's, it's a very short time frame before Peace Walker. That's when all the, the, the Patriots are funded, uh, Big Boss has a falling out with Zero. Well, there's a lot you could do with Fox that. Sound you gets, you know, back and forth. Too, yeah, yeah no, so that that, exciting. that's another, I guess, pocket of lore that I, I think they specifically stayed away from that because, yeah. yeah. Maybe they didn't have anything to say, but you never know. Um, all right, we have time for one more question, I think, for this team. Uh, and this is, I think, pretty important because you guys are all giants, more or less, in uh, the different fields that you're working with here. That's why you're on this panel. We appreciate your attendance, of course, and giving us insight into... Uh, your world and your creation, but we want to expand this community as much as possible. What would you say to those who are looking to stream, looking to create content, looking to uh, be a Metal Gear creator and uh, help expand, you know, the amount of people who could eventually be up here and talk to the rest of us about what they're thinking? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier with other content creators. Um, honestly, it, you have to determine whether you're trying to do this for a living or uh, for fun as a hobby. Yeah. Uh, the times are a little different today than when I started um, because there was, there was no such thing as doing it for a living when I started. So now somebody could potentially get into it with the idea that they're, they're going to be able to do it for a living. Um, and uh, that's not always the case. So first, figure that out, what your goals are. And once you do, uh, it's kind of going back to what he was saying, uh, you know, be yourself, um, highlight your qualities that are unique about you, and definitely, definitely uh, get uh, some kind of connections, networking, mingle with other content creators. And I, I kind of do want to give a little bit of, um, this might be surprising, but health-related warning. I got where I got because I got I work really hard on my body in ways that I cannot recommend anybody does. Because you're a it, marathon streamer, right? Yes, so, yeah. that's the thing. I cannot, in my good faith, recommend to anybody do what what I did to get there, <laughs> because yeah. But um, it was a complete, completely new concept when I started and foreign to uh, me completely, but. The people on Twitch really, really appreciate when you stream for a long time. Mm. Right. So I kind of got hooked in the, into that and like, oh, damn, you're still streaming. I went to bed and you're still streaming. I'm mm. back now. And I never thought that, because, uh, you know, uh, growing up, I heard the exact opposite. Nobody's going to pay you to play games mm. <laughs> and you shouldn't play for so long. <laughs> Yeah. And then it turns out that it's the exact opposite. People on Twitch appreciate that, but uh, while consistency is important if you're doing live stream content, um, yeah, there's of sort yourself. of that kind of balance, yeah, because it goes both ways. You want to take care of yourself, but people also really appreciate it when you stream for a long time. Yeah. Max, uh, what about those, can these focus videos with the long form content? How, how does someone get into that? What do you recommend for them? Well, it's kind of like what Yang said before about Metal Gear Solid V. If you feel like there's an aspect of the fandom that isn't being emphasized enough and that you're passionate about, go speak up about it. And that's what I did in regards to Metal Gear Solid Two. I, I felt that that entire game's narrative was so prescient in regards to where we are right now with the information and uh, the way that AI is going to be influencing the world. And I managed to get something kind of successful out of that. So, and you know, even if uh, you, you can't uh, find something like that, just do the content because you're passionate about it. Do montages, just do videos talking about it. Just be a part of the community and uh, be a part of amplifying its voice so that way we can bring the joy of what this wonderful franchise is to as many people as possible. Everybody plays a role. Yeah, um, on the sort of news cycle side of things, you know, uh, 
there was definitely a time where me making Metal Gear content like wouldn't have been as viable because of just the, the split that happened and the fact that Metal Gear just kind of faded away for a minute, right? But things are coming back with Metal Gear Solid 3 or Metal Gear Solid Delta. And so like now is a good time to like kind of start getting into that kind of content. And, you know, part of it is like being realistic with like what's trending as well. And so if Metal Gear Solid 3 is trending right now, it's like making some content for Metal Gear Solid 3 might, you know, feed the algorithm and all these things that unfortunately is an aspect of, you know, viewership and all these things. So if, like, if you're focused on that, uh, you know, look at what, what is trending currently Metal Gear wise. But generally, you know, if you put the love into the content and it's compelling and, you know, it's well edited and it, it just draws people in and whether you're explaining lore or whether you're doing a retrospective of older games or, or, or reliving, you know, events that happened during the marketing and stuff like that and just have fun with it. People want to tune in because it's just good content and it's compelling and, and uh, you know, like videos like what you made, you know, it's, it's, you're talking about this game that's so many years old, but it still resonates with people because of how special that game was. So um, that's really the mark of a series that will be, you know, I think everlasting. And so there will, there will always be an audience for Metal Gear, I think. Um, and, and yeah, hopefully Metal Gear can come back in some major way if these upcoming projects are handled right. And we can all like the, the Metal Gear community can grow further, um, but yeah, the main thing is be passionate about what you do and what you make. If you love the thing, then you know th there, there's nothing else that you need. You'll be happy, and your audience will be happy with the content you make. Yeah, and I have a little question for you actually. Yeah. Uh, as a YouTuber, and you know, versus live streaming, yeah. would you say that there's a factor of uh, obviously getting lucky, but for your community kind of entertaining itself? Because sometimes, you know, I feel that I got lucky doing what I do because yeah. my community is like not an active live chat yeah. and they sort of kind of entertain themselves. Yeah, yeah, how, yeah. Does that, um, how does that translate into the YouTube, YouTube yeah, side of things? Yeah, my side of things, you know, the comment section can get pretty wild, you know. <laughs> so I, I, you know, especially back in the day when I, you know, these days we have thousands and thousands of comments, you know, it's hard to respond to every single one. But, um, you know, when I had sort of smaller numbers and I could, like, uh, you know, I had a couple hundred comments maybe that I could, like, sift through and, like, theorize with, uh, I had a lot of fun just, like, really interacting with people. And then, like, I, I guided them to my Twitter uh, page. And there I put out some, you know, uh, some hot takes here and there about, oh, maybe, you know, maybe this is a theory that we could talk about. And so, yeah, it, it is uh, less of a live thing, but you can take your time to respond. And uh, the comment people also scroll through comment sections by themselves just to see what everyone else is saying. And everyone wants to know what everyone else is saying because everyone wants to draw ideas from everyone else and see like what theories they can come up with. And it, like, it's this thing that feeds itself because everyone. That's what I was getting at. It's like yeah. snowballing because yeah, exactly. the audience in itself is part of the entertainment. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So. We kind of do have to, you know, I really like to thank my viewers right now for that. Yeah, no, same with me. Like, the reason I'm here today is because of Metal Gear and the passion that you guys showed and the, everyone tuning into, like, my content and stuff like that. Um, I, I had to evolve. I couldn't just be a Metal Gear content creator because that, that was just not viable uh, anymore, you know, after what happened. But... I still, you know, when, when Metal Gear Solid 3 or Metal Gear Solid Delta was announced and I had that reaction and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm making Metal Gear content again and I'm going to like analyze these screenshots. And it's like, it took me back to, you know, the apex It's like of, you're home uh, again. Yeah, it was like, that, that's exactly it. It was like I was home again. And there was just this like sense of comfort and joy that I hadn't felt in a long time. Even though I love the content I make now, Metal Gear is always going to be special. And so when I can make content for something that special again, Oh, like I was reinvigorated. Part of your DNA. Y yes. <laughs> yeah. Part of my genes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, thanks, everyone. I really appreciate these answers. It's really helpful, especially for anyone here listening and, and looking to uh, engage in that kind of stuff. Um, I want to spend some time playing a little bit of a game, if that's okay with oh, everyone. Uh, so I'm not sure all you can see the projection screen over there, but if not, I'm going to just speak out what I see on the monitor here okay. for our panelists. And we're going to go ahead and go to pass that slide. Who wants, who wants to see me? Pass that, pass that. Very next one. We're going to do uh, some kind of rapid fire questions. Oh, I want you guys no. to just tell me your answer. I don't need a long explanation. If you try, I'm going to cut you off. So please just go ahead and answer, and then we'll go on to each one as, as it comes along. So first one is an easy, a softball, Metal Gear Solid, or Twin Snakes? Just 
right across the line. Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear Solid. There's Metal Gear Solid. I'll just stop there. Metal Gear Solid. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Consensus, I think. Canon or head cannon? Canon. <laughs> I, I respect Kojima's uh, take head on cannon. his head own cannon. Canon. Yeah. Canon. Yeah. All right. All right. Next one. Meryl or Otacon? Oh, no. <laughs> Bro, don't do this to me. Um, Easily Otacon ending. Oh. oh. Uh, yeah, Otacon. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl, I, I love you, but I got to go with Otacon. All right, Otacon, Otacon across the board. Three nice. for three. Three for three for Otacon. Uh, next one. We chose correctly. Jeans are dominant or recessive? Recessive. Recessive jeans can, uh, you know, they can do some work. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the whole point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> recessive? Rec sure. <laughs> sure. Why not? The recessive jeans win. Next one. All right, so oh. you don't have to choose from this four only, but here's an example of kind of what I'm asking here. Uh, the box, especially when the wolves pee on it. There you go. <laughs> uh, without those cigs, you can't see those lasers, man. You can't do anything. You got to have those cigs. That's yeah, it's part of mystique, too, right? Well, I mean, if you don't have the card, you can't get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You know I, I think Check we can me. all agree that well the scope is the most, most useless item on the floor. <laughs> uh, next. Uh, which buddy? Oh, oh. easily, easily D-Horse, the most useful buddy. Yep. Ah, oh, but Didi's such a good boy. <laughs> He's such a good boy. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Well, once you know what the soldiers are, you don't, you don't need, <laughs> you don't need D dog D-Horse is always the fastest way to get to, to stuff. But he's a good boy. He's sure. a good boy. Yeah. Metal Gear? Metal Gear. Mm, which one, mm. though? This isn't even all of them. I couldn't fit it. I'm it, sorry. It, <laughs> I tried. Do I only get, like, you one word, pick one. You one get word one. answer, Ray? You get one. Ray? Oh, man. Ray, I love Ray's sleekness, but Rex is such a classic yeah. that I can't, you know, yeah. Yeah, Rex. Yeah. Two Rexes and a Ray. Huh? He does count, but he's not on the list. I'm sorry, but you could say it. <laughs> you could say it. That's okay. Non-lethal or lethal? Let's go back. Food? On, go back. <laughs> You're spoiling me here. Non-lethal or lethal? It really depends on the game, but non-lethal. Non-lethal. Okay. Non-lethal is a fun challenge, especially in MGS3, when you can just blow through the sorrow. You're just like, what, what are you going to do? I can kill anybody. What? I'm just going just gonna to take a stroll real quick in the land of the dead. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd go non-lethal for it's, mostly two and five, yeah. It's like the name of the game. I are we allowed like. to argue with each other? Yes, but later. Oh, cool. <laughs> Next. Okay, is it food? Food? Did you eat it? So MGS3 tells you that does not taste good. Okay. Are you asking me to like pick an animal that I'd like to eat? Pick that animal. Do you want to eat that animal? Oh, I thought you were asking if the parrot is food. No, yeah, parrot. You want to, do you want to eat the parrot? Are you can eat oh. the parrot. It tastes bad. Is is the parrot food? Yeah. I could. That's that's a beautiful animal. I just couldn't. <laughs> no, I couldn't do, do it. it. Couldn't do it. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Is that the ends parrot or is that? Uh, that's the ends parrot. Okay. That's not a that's conspiracy. The Are they one of the same? That's not the ends parrot. I couldn't get his photograph. But. Okay. Uh, no. No. You know. <laughs> All right. See, that's another conspiracy. There. Are they one of the same? Those oh, parrots oh. have a long lifespan. It could be a lot of parrots. It's like a whole cage full of them. All right. Next one. Uh, why are we still here? Which area? Which area is, is the best? Most uh, fascinating. Shadow whatever. Moses. Shadow Moses. Okay. Shadow Moses, without question, is iconic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Shadow Moses. Oh, I mean, they used it again shot. in the fourth one. Right? Surprise, upset. All right, next. Snake. Oh. Question mark on Raiden. Oh, man, okay. Snake. Easily solid snake. Who's their favorite one out of all of them? Uh, your, your call as to what I'm asking here. Well, like, Liquid Ocelot. No. Um, <laughs> I, big Boss is just... I. I Naked Snake, I, he's just so, I, I love the, the, the swagger that he has, that Solid Snake mm. just, Solid Snake is a lot more subdued and depressed. Solid, Naked Snake, you know, in his prime, was just like, all right, let's do this. You know, he was just, <laughs> he was just ready for action. I love his attitude, yeah. I've always been a riding evangelist. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Plus, my wife would kill me if I didn't say riding. Uh, <laughs> which one of these uh, crews of baddies? Oh. Foxhound. I, I'm a little partial to the Cobra unit, not going to yeah. lie. They're pretty badass. I'm going to go with Dead Cell. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. Split. Nice. All right, next one. The iPod or oh. the Walkman? Easily the iPod. iPod. 
Unless we're talking... There's something tactical about the Walkman that I like. I don't know. Maybe I'm... Can we, can we have the Peace know, Walker I mean, Walkman? Like, can we have the what? The Peace Walker Walkman. Uh, just, yeah, you could say that if you want. Okay. Peace then Walker, then Peace Walker Walkman. Walkman. Yeah, okay. I, I love just analog technology. There's something about them that's just really interesting and cool and the feel that the I know. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, There's just something about that button press that you just... Uh. <laughs> so I, I have to go with uh, the Walkman. Nice. Plus, I just I think I preferred the song selection. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I'm old. I'm sorry. Uh, which song? Speaking of song selection. Oh, oh bro. God. Don't, why? <laughs> which uh, vocal theme, more specifically? So vocal I I won't go into details, but after my chat kind of ruined the best is yet to come for me. <laughs> uh, you might know what I'm talking about. Uh, I won't repeat it here, but um, oh no. Uh, I'm gonna go with Heaven's Divide. Heaven's Divide. Oh. All right. Snake it up. There you go. There's just, there's nothing, like there's nothing like it. That Bond theme going, yeah. There's nothing like it. I just got to go with Snake Eater. Though I got I to gotta give a special shout out to Calling to the Night from uh, Portable Ops. Mm. Yeah. There's something about that theme that just gets me. I don't know. I feel it. I feel it. Max? Yeah, this should be more of a top three question, I think. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go outside. I'm going to go Way to Fall because that's just oh. the perfect song yeah. to play after he gives the salute and just I respect to that. decompress the, the emotion that you feel in that moment. Did you know that Kojima only picked Star Sailor because he misheard somebody <laughs> suggesting him something else in Star Sailor? <laughs> 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 All right, I think there's one more. <laughs> Machines. Son! <laughs> uh, however you want to answer this. What, yes or no? That's it's however you want to answer it. <laughs> Nano Machines, question mark. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Nano Machines? Sure. <laughs> All right, I think we have about <laughs> great way to end this. I think we have about five minutes left. Uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions, and we should have a hot mic somewhere. There we go. Nice. Uh, raise your hand, and he'll go ahead and go to them. There's one right back there. Yeah. Like right What's first. up? We got the first question right here. Yeah. Hey guys. Uh, first off, thank you for coming here. Obviously, um, it means a lot to us, Maker fans. Um, I'm just curious to know your guys' uh, perspective on um, how you guys think uh, the franchise would have well. Uh, I guess more or less, how it would have changed if they would have kept in uh, Mission 51, uh, Kingdom of the Flies, in uh, Metal Gear Solid 5? It probably would have had more glitches on that one mission, too. <laughs> I don't know, man. It, that, that's hard to contemplate. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious as to why it was cut at all, you know? Um, and Maybe people, will, like, the, the discussion would be more focused on, I suppose, Metal Gear Solid 5, the game itself, rather than the fact that it wasn't finished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Maybe it would have. Do you feel that uh, Venom is solid in? Uh, no. So the whole concept of Venom did not exist when Sniper Wolf's dialogue was being written. That's how the series right. works. So, no. Yeah, yeah he answered it. Well, you see, there's all these people that Big Boss rescues in Africa in the 80s. It's a good thing uh, there's a Big Boss game in Africa in the 80s, right? <laughs> uh, we see a lot of them. Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, there's Sniper Wolf, there's Naomi, there's Gray Fox. Apparently, if you play Rising, if you go by that, uh, does Mistral also kind of hint at the fact that, you know, he came and saved her? Mm. Where, where's that? Yeah, no, I, I, I echo Derek's uh, sentiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is going to have to be our last question for this panel, okay. so. So my main question is, is whenever Metal Gear Survive came out, how disappointed were you guys when you came to the last area and you saw a destroyed Saw Holanthropist, and you were like, wow, all these assets were pretty much recompleted, and all those designs that were supposed to be in five showed up. How did you feel when you saw that implemented and survived? <laughs> well, that was just a sentiment that I felt the entire time I was playing it. <laughs> I I couldn't get through survive all the way. Like, it, not a fan. I, I just you know it's like I when you play it in short bursts, it's like you can have some potential fun if you have like friends and stuff. But I just feel like over the long term, the systems and the gameplay just didn't quite click for me. Um, in the gameplay loop, and it just didn't feel like Metal Gear to me. And so, I didn't get to that point. And so I, I didn't have many feelings surrounding that. Yeah. I'm just gonna tell you what my reaction was as soon as I first heard Salanthropus wasn't survive. I am pretty sure I turned off the game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for joining us <laughs> here on this note. panel, content creators. Appreciate DRK, Yongi, and Max Dirt. Thank you guys for coming, and thank you everyone for checking it out. The next panel, I believe, you can go to the next slide to see it. It says, uh, they have the music. music one, yeah. There you go. Music, yeah, uh, we got a digital DRK will be thing coming up over too. The gaming area, so go ahead and check them out. Thanks, yeah. guys. Uh, yeah. Another big round of applause for all the content creators.
Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>